Thank you everyone for joining. So we're all aware that the world as we know it has fundamentally changed. And history has shown us that every major crisis and major event reshapes our world, leads to huge changes in the way we live and work. The Great Depression, World War II, 9-11. And today we're facing multiple concurrent crises, a global health crisis, a global economic crisis, a global crisis of racial injustice. So inevitably, this will create wide scale systemic change that creates a new normal for us. And we know for businesses, digital and digital transformation will be key to that future. But we also know that the future will not look the same for everyone. There will be winners and losers. And the choices that businesses make today will shape what their tomorrow will look like. It's true in all industries, and it is especially true in banking. So there's no question, world events are reshaping banking in extraordinary ways. The question is, what does your bank need to do? And that's what we're here to discuss today. So welcome to today's session, Banking on Change. I'm Stacey Simpson. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Gempact, and I'm delighted to have Chris Skinner. He's a world-leading expert on banking and financial technology. He's written oodles and oodles of books, I think 16 to be exact, including his latest book, Doing Digital. And my favorite thing about Chris is that he is a self-proclaimed troublemaker. So, I mean, how can you not like that? So before we jump into the content here, a uh, couple of things. So you will see a number of polling questions throughout the, the, the session. So I think you'll see the first one um, come up now. Thanks, Stacey, for having me on the GEMPACT uh, discussion today. Um, I uh, have been locked down here in Poland for the last five months, so uh, it's a clear change that we're connecting digitally across continents and across the world. Um, in fact, what's clear to me is I blog every day, and I started a karaoke challenge a week last Monday, and um, every Monday I'm creating a new banking song. So if you want to have fun, join in the karaoke challenge. Um, when we were talking about the format of this discussion, I said, you know, there's folks who see what's going to happen, which is where I try and sit, because I'm always looking towards what's next. There's people who are looking at what's happening, and there's a lot of people who go, what happened? <laughs> and a lot of people right now are going, what happened? It's incredible that with the clear forecasting of a pandemic, no one forecasted a pandemic. You know, um, there were so many... Uh, processes and um, simulations of what this would mean if and when it happened and then it happened and none of those simulations mattered because people weren't ready uh, in fact there's two sorts of companies that there were those that were ready and those that were not and I think about 80% of the traditional banks I deal with were not ready about 80% of the fintech companies I deal with were ready and that's because the fintech companies were spawned and born on the internet. So they were digital from day one, whereas the traditional banks have been physical and are trying to convert to digital, which is a, a massive challenge. My book, Doing Digital, was all about how do you do this process? Um, but there's a big difference between this crisis and the last one in 2008. And so when we talk about what's happened, um, I always remember in 2008, uh, Jamie Dimon, uh, a chap from JP Morgan Chase you may have heard of, um, said that his seven-year-old daughter said, what's a financial crisis? And he said something that happens about every seven years. Yeah, and it's true, we have regular financial crisis, but we never expect a massive one, which is what we're going through right now. And the big difference between this one and the last one is the last one, it was the banks that failed and had to be bailed out. This one is the governments that have failed and the people have to be bailed out. And I think that's the fundamental difference of approach, which is why when you mentioned the CARES Act and the you know, distribution of benefits directly to customers, if possible, typically by check into a bank branch. <laughs> it's like, oh dear me guys, you know, this, this is very last century. Which brings me to, I guess, what's happening. Um, because when I look at uh, Asia, Europe, Latin America, North Americas, there's huge differences in what's happening. Um, if you look at China, it's actually transitioned really rapidly to digital because it was digital before. Most of China was already on the internet. 
already on the mobile smartphone, already using super apps, already paying using systems that are far in advance of every other country. In fact, I'm a big fanboy of uh, Ant Financial, which is the payments division of Alibaba. And um, when I was doing a case study on them for my last book three years ago, uh, there was a lot of things that um, came out of that. But one particular one was the development of Smile to Pay. And so they've been doing biometric payments over the last five years, um, just using facial recognition. So you don't even have to have your phone with you. You don't have to have any cash with you. Most tier one cities in China are completely cashless. And in fact, I blogged today about you can now use your nose to pay. And when you actually read it, I, I find it quite funny. When you insure your pets, your cats and dogs, they take a biometric of the dog and cat's noses for the pet's insurance policies to make sure that if you do claim, it's really that pet that you're claiming for. So this development is really interesting of advanced technologies in Asia. In Europe, we've been pretty awful. I mean, I mean when we talk about what's happening, the lockdown came and um, a lot of companies here and in the USA are global companies that have customer service centers, not necessarily onshore. So my bank has the customer service center offshore in India and India locked down with four hours notice. So suddenly there's no call center. And when you think about the impact of that, you know, the bank had no setup in the UK for a call center. All their staff in the UK were at home and not trained to work in a call center. And yet customers were ringing with 10 times, 20 times the volume because they are desperate for help and there's no one there. I haven't been able to speak to my bank since the middle of March literally. And I've had issues with online access. So I couldn't get online. I couldn't get hold of them on the phone. You know, th that's what I mean by some were ready and some were not. And there's a huge issue here because what it made me do is think about moving to a challenger bank. So I downloaded the challenger banks app and I literally could open an account in 10 minutes using the app. You know, they were ready. The bank, traditional banks were not. And I think that's going to have a huge impact post-pandemic on customer loyalty and customer impressions. In particular, I think what's been interesting for me, because, again, we did, we did the simulations, but we didn't take heed, is that the backup to the bank's technology services has business continuity and disaster recovery and all the things that we do really well to make sure they could keep running if there was any impact on the technologies but there was no business continuity planning for the physical office. There was in the sense of a terrorist attack, another office. <laughs> and yet now we're sitting here and going, geez, you know, everyone's stuck at home working from home. And the biggest impact that's had, to be honest, is the rapid move to embracing digital transformation and cloud-based services. But for the banks that were not ready for this, it's very difficult to be digital and move to cloud when all your technology people and management are locked down at home and so that's been a huge issue uh, but what I do know because I've spoken to quite a few of the cloud service providers is they've seen a huge uptick in people signing contracts and in fact just in the last week there's been headlines about Deutsche Bank doing a 10-year deal with um, Google Cloud um, and uh, there's a number of others with Microsoft Azure and um, IBM, you, you name it, that, you know, that move to cloud, it has an urgency today. Uh, and, and why didn't they do it before? Well, the main reason they didn't do it before is because they were nervous about security and risk. You know, there's typically most banks that I've dealt with had 20% at, you know, in the best banks in the cloud before the pandemic hit. But what was they had in the cloud were shared services like payroll and human resources and marketing. That they didn't want to put customer data or provide employees access to customer data through the cloud, but they've been forced to do that during this lockdown. And that's been a fundamental shift. Um, having said that, there are some that were way ahead of the curve. Um, DBS in Singapore is a case study in the new book. And 80% of what they do is cloud-based. 80%. You know, it's incredible. It's one of the best you know, numbers I, I, I've, I've seen, but it's taken them 10 years to get there. And it's been a planned migration of services over 10 years to get there. It's not been an overnight shift. But I think that there is now an overnight shift happening. So when we talk about what's happening, it's an overnight shift to digital and cloud and embracing the technologies that we should have embraced a, a decade ago. 
And when we go forward and look forward, it's quite interesting um, because there's obviously a post-pandemic world that we haven't quite worked out what it looks like. But um, a comment from Jez Staley, the CEO of Barclays Bank, resonated with me, which is the days of cramming 7,000 people into a massive skyscraper headquarters are over. And I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about what's the point of an office when we can do everything over the internet. And now that we are doing everything over the internet, what, will we go back to the office? Will we go back to the physical store? Will we go back to the physical exchange? Will we go back to cash? Um, when this crisis began, I actually was um, thinking about what might happen. And I ran down and took a thousand dollars out in cash from the nearest ATM. I haven't really touched it, but it was that thing around what happens if the internet breaks down, the technology breaks down, what are we going to do? How are we going to pay for things? So lots and lots of questions around how will the post pandemic world work? And what's interesting about the 2008 crisis is, is that it spawned a FinTech innovation explosion, whereby hundreds of billions of dollars have been invested in thousands of startup companies that have really changed the way in which everybody thinks about financial services. Uh, and if it hasn't changed the way you think about it, then you're probably going to be saying what's happened and you won't be around because the key thing for me is um, the, the message of change. Uh, Charles Darwin talks about the survival of species and says that it's not the fastest, the fittest, the strongest, or the most intelligent who survive. It's the ones that are the, the most adaptable to change. But are you changing in the right way? You know, there's a lot of people changing in the wrong way. They think digital is a project. It's something that you just assign to a line of business and appoint a chief digital officer and give them a budget and a team and go do it. They treat it as a delegation. And if you imagine, if you're a bank, that you were born on the internet, what would that bank look like? And how similar is it to the bank you've got? And for those who had their call centers shut down and weren't ready for digital and their backup to their office was another office, how fit were you for doing what we're doing today and talking about what we're doing today? A lot of the people were not. Um, so that to me is a, a big, big message. Um, post pandemic, I, I think people are, are starting to get it. But again, do you have the right people in the organization to lead that change? Do you have the right uh, operational and executive leadership team structure? BBVA, we're really interesting in that they're one of the few banks I've ever met where half of their operational executive leadership team had a background in tele technology and telecommunications. They had a head of data, a head of engineering, a head of customer experience, a chief executive and a chairman who came from a technology and telecoms background. You know, over half, well actually no, it's about half, half of the team that were leading the bank are digital. And that to me is, is a clear, clear message that you can't be a digital bank if you only have bankers running the bank. You've got to be a digital bank with digital people and bankers running the bank. Uh, you know, one, one of the banks that I met said technology is business, business is technology. And as they walked me around, the compliance, treasury, risk, product, credit people, all of the teams that were doing finance typically were small teams, eight to 10 in size, of which one was a designer and one was a developer. You know, so technology is business, business is technology. That's a cultural thing. That's, that's the post-pandemic world that we have to move towards in terms of how we think about the future. Because what's really happened and is happening and it's going to happen is we've got 2030 delivered in 2020. You know, we've turbocharged change to move swiftly from what was being a prevarication that we could put on the back burner to being an urgent transformation that has to be on the front burner. You know, it's a burning platform. There's a fire under the company. You know, I said that I've been locked down here for several months. My savior has been Amazon. You know, the, the fact I could get stuff and get it delivered to my door in Poland. You know, without that, I, I wouldn't have survived. Uh, my kids definitely wouldn't survive. They're four years old. I buy them regular costumes like C-3PO and Stormtroopers. I couldn't survive with them at home if I didn't have that party stuff. You know, so it's really about a rapid world change. 
Um, interestingly, everyone thought the banks would be disrupted and destroyed. You know, a lot of the fintech round one um, blows were about banking is going to be destroyed by um, technology and by the crisis. And yet the biggest banks in America have grown massively in the last 12 years. They're $800 trillion bigger. So where are we going post pandemic? And to me, the, the fact that the customer and the employee has seen the impact of this digital and physical world change means that they are actually moving rapidly to saying customers are going to switch after this, which they didn't after the last crisis. Customers are disillusioned with the banks. They were after the last crisis. They're even more disillusioned now for the banks that none performed. The fintechs that can open accounts in 10 minutes when banks can't even be spoken to for four months are going to be really taking a market share growth over the post-pandemic world. But the biggest thing of all is something I learned in Ant Financial and Alipay when I saw a poster on the wall, which is Jack Marr's cultural values. And they're really simple. Be good for society, be good for the world. Jamie Dimon, Business Roundtable, end of last year, produced this new statement, a manifesto for stakeholder relations rather than shareholder focus that everyone signed up for, you know, almost 200 of the biggest corporations in America. And yet literally almost the next day, some of them were laying off staff. You know, what actual consideration is that to your stakeholders when you treat your people like, you know what? Um, you have to have a purpose-driven bank. But if I give you my vision of the next generation bank post pandemic, it's a process driven platform based bank with a clear purpose. And by being platform based, I mean, open banking, open APIs, partnering, open apps, open services, open minds. I mentioned I talked to the cloud providers and what amused me is they had quite a number of uh, very large banks, tier one banks, that they've been talking to for a long time about cloud services. Um, and as I say, there's been prevarication. The pandemic hit and these large banks said, we're, we're, we're ready. And <laughs> the, the, the cloud providers said, well, you can get to the back of the queue because you know, we've got customers here who have to deal with first because they were there before you. And right. um, it, th there's a serial change. Yeah, I think there's no, no question there. Why don't we, because I think a lot of what we're talking about, um, you know, what has accelerated, uh, you know, where have we changed, where have, have changes been made as far as how people are thinking about your point, you're, you know, hesitant on cloud and then boom, they're ready to go because of the environment, but you have to wait in line. Let's actually take a look at some of these polls and see what the, the people on this call, our participants were, have been experiencing themselves. So the first question, by what percentage has your organization increased its budget for, dig for digital transformation as a result of the world events? So there has certainly been some incremental increase. Buy my books. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, what's interesting is um, to the budget question that um, in March, I, the, f uh, the figures were quite stunning for some businesses. Um, so, for example, WH Smith, the bookstores that depend heavily on airports and airport traffic, saw an 85% drop in business. And Amazon saw a 24% increase in retail business, if you forget cloud. I think cloud was up 35%. Um, uh, but equally, Zoom that we're using here moved from 10 million users in December to 300 million in March. You know, in four months, 10 million to 300 million. And um, my advice is basically that if you don't look at the numbers, if you don't look at the shift, um, you're either already wholly digital, congratulations, or you're stupid. Yeah, so we'll let, I guess, everyone can choose for themselves <laughs> which category they're, they're in. And, you know, again, if you are a principal at a bank, if you're part of the senior management, it's how do you think about um, where you are? Versus I think, Chris, you know, your statements are stark, but, but, but incredibly important, right? How do you make sure you're not in that latter category um, that, that Chris just mentioned? Okay, timeline, right? Uh, by what percentage has your organi organization accelerated its timeline for digital transformation? Well, we're seeing about the same in that, in that category. 
uh, you know, in that 11 to 30 category. Uh, no, interestingly, very few had not at all. So, so speed, and we have certainly seen this speed in this environment has become absolutely critical. Speed to decision making, speed to being able to react to to what we what what we see around us, the conditions that continue to change. Uh, Chris, what's your reflection on that? Um, well, re reiterating what I said before, um, in terms of. Uh, follow my stuff and at the same time take into account how your own behaviors are changing. Um, but I think what's been in interesting is that, um, and I said 2030 has been delivered in 2020, is that a lot of what we could do before, we could do digitally and we just didn't do it digitally because we didn't need to. Um, we didn't need to be on Zoom virtual conference calls and you know, before um, March we called it a webinar, whereas now we call it a virtual conference, which is um, obviously, you know, we're changing our thinking up, we're changing our behaviors. And I've actually polled quite a lot of people around, you know, will we go back to the way it was before? No. What is going to be the new normal? And the new normal, um, I, I actually blogged about four different scenarios of which the worst one is that um, we have heavy, heavy government control of uh, people's movements, which actually will lead to civil unrest and um, riots and war which the Black Lives Matter issue and other things that are happening around the world, like the US-China relationships, um, are starting to bring to mind because we've moved from a global focus to a local focus physically. In fact, most of us have actually probably moved into a domestic focus. And yet digitally, we still have that global connectivity and focus. And that I've been doing many, many meetings uh, like this, connecting globally. And so I think the real thing in terms of accelerating timelines is to think about the impact of what's happening uh, nationally and locally on people's behaviors and your own behaviors and what that means to your organizational structure and operations and how the internet's fitting into that and whether you're actually exploiting that opportunity well enough or whether perhaps you be, need to be doing it faster and, and stronger. Oh, great, excellent. Let's take a look at, I think our, our third and I think final poll question and we can start tackling some of the questions from the group. Okay, this is workforce. What percentage of your workforce do you anticipate will return to office within the next year? As we know, you know, this is a question that banks in particular have, grapp have been grappling with significantly, even more, frankly, than, than many other industries um, because of so much of banking was, was very much viewed as needing to be done sort of on premise. So if we look here, um, certainly up to 20% and 21 to 40%, uh, nobody expects 100%. Frankly, that doesn't surprise me at all. What are your reactions to this? No, I guess I'm surprised it's not higher, but um, I think a lot of financial services companies are still conservative about the risk and exposure of um, home-based staff. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, in technology, I've been hot desking for over 20 years and hot desking was accepted. Um, and home working became very accepted. I've probably been home working now for 15 years. Um, because I'm in technology, but technology has a lot less regulation than banking. And it's that regulatory thing that gets um, financial institutions uh, uptight about risk and security. I mean, most banks, there's a figure in fact from Bank of America that the average US bank has 128,000 regulations. The average US technology company has 27,000. Know, uh, so five times more regulation makes you nervous about people not being in the office for that reason. Um, but now that we've gone through this and awakens to the fact that it can be done, I think a lot of people will be saying, well, okay, that's fine then. And it goes back to the turbocharging of, tra of transformation um, because it wouldn't have been accepted in 2020 to work from home if you're involved in customer exposed data areas. In tw 2021, it is. I'm scrolling through our questions. Let me, um, there, we, we've got a lot coming in. So I'm, gonna, I'm doing some quick reading. Uh, let me start with the first one um, from our audience. So as companies, and again, we've been talking a lot about this, as they start to sort of, you know, fast forward and expedite this journey to the cloud and through, you know, an API and open banking, um, how does this influence customer experience? Um, I'll try and give it quick, but basically most financial institutions 
that were around before the internet were built for the industrial revolution and the processing of paper through buildings with humans and the customer experience was wait in line um you know wait for the next teller to be available um and now we deal with the digital distribution of data through a global network of software and servers that's instant service and instant capabilities in real time. Um, and the customer's expect expectations are raised immensely by the experiences they see with digital services like Amazon, as I mentioned, um, or Netflix or, or Spotify or others. And we've seen the revolution in entertainment and media. I've had, I've, I've had these, these issues and when the network goes down and it does go down, um, what does the customer do and how do you deal with that situation? These are, went down in Europe um, about a year ago and customers couldn't pay. What, what does that do for the customer experience and expectation? Um, so you have to be aware of obviously the business continuity and disaster recovery, but equally, how do you deal with the customer experience when you go down? Okay, next question from the audience. Uh, totally agree with the need to accelerate digitization, but this must be partnered with a focus on improving end-to-end -end customer experience. Are you seeing any great practices in this combination? One of the interesting things for me in researching doing digital, which is basically I spoke to five big banks around the world around how they're doing digital and combined that with my own insights and experiences. And one of the ones that was consistent across most of them is the customer journey and the customer focus, you know, the, the customer obsession. And so they, they, they are definitely customer obsessed with the end-to-end -end customer experience. But more than that, um, they build a management measurement and reward system around that. So the, the management within these banks will only get their bonus for the year. Obviously, if achieving all the other measures of digital sales, employee engagement, but part of it is they have to go through a customer journey. They have to take out a credit card or open an account. They have to experience it themselves to see what it's like, which I think is really interesting. You know, every single manager in the bank had to go through that, that, uh, that experience so that they can feel it themselves. And I, I, I used to talk about that most banks think that the customer um, floats around the bank every day and they're the center of the universe. It's wrong. The, you know, the customer is the sun. So you have to work out how can you see the sun and make sure that you organize your bank to go around that universe and not your own universe. And the biggest difference we now have is that customers are designing their own experiences through the internet to achieve their needs. And you know, with that changes thinking because um, when you think about the flattening of the world, the death of distance, we're in a world where uh, I can do almost anything for free for, for most of my life. Um, what I, I do in my business, blogging every day, that used to be a newsletter that had to be put in the post and would cost me a fortune. Now I just do it for free on, on WordPress. So it's, it's a, a real m cultural mental change to be digital and understand the customer's digital, are you? Yeah, and I think that's, it's a great point. I think just, I think it transitions actually very well to the next, to the next question. So we've been talking a lot about the need for banks to move from you know, digital as a, as a channel or discrete set of projects to, to really digital at the core, digital as a business model and digital in service to being organized around the customer. What is the single biggest factor in being able to make that move? Because it's, it's, you know, it's a catchy thing to say. Yeah. What's, how do you take that step? I keep saying digital transformation is nothing to do with technology. It's about cultural change okay. management. And within that, the hardest thing is the middle management because the middle management are often the most resistant to change because they've worked in the institution for five, 10, 15, 20 years. They've built a reputation and a status. They're comfortable in their job. They don't want their cheese to move. They've got some power and status. And they're really worried when people talk digital and think, I'm gonna lose all my team. I might lose my job. You know, what's gonna happen here? And so what you really have to do is have brilliant communication around the implications of the change culture and transformation that you're going through and engagement of people, particularly the middle management and the employees and making it clear that you, you don't have to worry unless you don't want to change. You know, change is the only constant. If you don't want to do this, that, then you do need to worry. But 
the communication around that is key. And I, I, again, it's going back to my own experiences for a long time in doing transformation. You have to create a burning platform that makes people really uncomfortable, as in you will lose your job if you don't do digital and engage in this program, and then create a vision and a direction and say, but here's where we're going to go. Can you tell us how we're going to get there? And, and you don't tell them, you ask them to tell you. I think it's I think it's great. And as we transition to the to the to the probably there our last question. I love that idea though, by the way, on discomfort. Like if you are not making yourself and your organization uncomfortable, you're you're not you're not going anywhere near um, far enough. So I, I think it's a really good, really good point. So this question, really interesting. It says as the industry platformizes, so moves towards platforms, um, do you think incumbent banks will seek to strive to own the customer experience? or opt to be the pipes for other competitors like the, the, the tech fins and fintechs, the people who might be owning some of that, the, the front end customer experience. I was going to say, I think there can be both in that um, you, I'll turn the question into a different one, which is what do you want to be when you grow up? And you may think you're grown up, but you grew up as an industrial physical entity in many cases of most banks and community banks and credit unions. Whereas now you've been born on the internet. So you, you've, creating a, a fresh and a new and what do you want to be when you grow up some will be front-end customer experience engagement services some will be back-end product and risk services some will be middle office apis and processing services some will be all of them some will be none of them and you really have to work out what is it you're going to be and make some tough decisions because moving from where we were to where we're going to be from physical to digital um the tough decisions are what products do you throw away because you have to design them around the customer, not around the organization and, and share, share a wallet and profit. What do you do about those customers? Because some customers are legacy customers. Do you get, throw them away? Uh, if you launch a new bank, which is what many banks seem to be doing, what do you do with the old bank? Do you let it wither on the vine? You've got to make tough decisions. And my answer to the last one is do never, ever let the old bank wither on the vine. Do not try and launch a new bank. Because if you let the old bank rot, the customers rot, the employees rot, you've got to change the bank. It's a really, really great, I think, um, comment for us to close on. I want to thank everyone for joining. Uh, we will be following up with you to get so to give some takeaways from this conversation. We had loads of questions that we didn't get to, so we'll, we'll, we'll bubble up some of those and see if we can get some of those answered for you and come back in our follow-up. But, but thank you all for joining.